almost five minutes. No, I wasn't here for it. <laughs> the uh, Earth, this is downtown Anchorage, as a result of the 9.2. Roads look like that. This is also Anchorage. It's March, and you can see snow on the roads, so you can see what a big area shook loose and skidded off into the inlet. The communities of Valdez, well, the earthquake was so huge and so severe and local, it caused a major tsunami, and communities like Kodiak, Seward, Valdez were very badly affected. But they felt the, the tsunami over here in Hawaii, and also in Crescent City, California. And in Crescent City, California, if the tsunami was like surges. The first couple of surges did damage, like the battering rams, and it was the third and fourth surges that got the people because they went downtown to see what was going on. Yet with all of that, with that earthquake, 9.2 lasted almost five minutes. See, I talked too much. For a free public tour in five minutes. Tour of the museum store near the front entrance and last approximately 45 minutes. Thank you. With all of that that went on in Alaska, the tsunami, the uh, less than 140 people lost their lives. And when you think of what we've heard about in Indonesia and also uh, Haiti and stuff, it's just miraculous. Now let me assure you, the buildings in Anchorage know where they are susceptible to shaking. You're safe. You may feel an earthquake, but the buildings are safe, okay? And so what brought, that didn't bring people to Alaska, but it is part of our psyche. What did bring people to Alaska is oil, and this is actually a piece of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Now on this little map, up on the North Slope, lots and lots of little pipes flow into this big one. And the big one starts in Bruno Bay, it goes all the way down to Valdez, 800 miles north to south Alaska, because uh, Valdez is another year-round ice cream port. And it crosses some earthquake zones. So where there's an earthquake zone, the pipeline is built up above the ground, and it's on Teflon, and it slides side to side, and it's on springs, it goes up and down, and it really works, because about uh, 12 years ago, we had a, the an earthquake across the Denali Fault, which is sort of down and through here, which did an awful lot of damage to their pipe, to their railroad, and to their roads. But the pipeline came through just fine. The other thing the pipeline has to worry about is permafrost. Now, if you can see our little map, where it's up north, it is blue, and that is permanently permafrost. Where it's white, white, there is no permafrost, but most of the map is green, which means discontinuous. Most of Alaska has got discontinuous, which means pockets of permafrost. Some have got it, some don't, but the permafrost is spread out all over. And the permafrost, you know, it's left over from the ice age, and you don't want to melt it. So the oil that comes out of the ground that goes into the pipes is, comes from so deep down it's hot. It stays hot through the pipes because of friction and you don't want to melt the permafrost. So where there is permafrost, the pipeline also is built up. It's above the ground for earthquake zones and permafrost. Where there is neither, it is buried. It's about half and half, but it's up and it's down, and it's up and it's down, and it's up and it's down, depending upon where the geologists have felt like it was safe. When the pipeline went in, well, first of all, let me just say it had always been a tension with the Native people saying, what gives? We've been here for a long time, and you newcomers, you know, this is what he got to. And it was a tension, but it wasn't a problem until the pipeline went in. And when you're crossing 800 miles of land, you need to know you've got access, that nobody can suddenly say, stop, quit it. You're, you're trespassing, stop. And so that's when the Native people and the federal government got together, and they solved the problem by corporations. Twelve regional corporations were formed. The natives gave up their land, and these cor corporations, each one got land and money. The land was their choice. They could maybe have the city of Anchorage. Most of them chose traditional hunting grounds. Down in southeast Alaska, where they got the big trees, they chose good timber land, where they could then clear cut the trees and send them off to market. The uh, money was about a billion dollars total, and it was divvied up mainly to start new businesses or to invest or to bring the native peoples into this century was the expression at the time. And so right now, those corporations are a major part of the Alaska economy. 
they bring money into the state. And if you were a native, one quarter blood native in 1971, you got 100 shares in the corporation of your choice. You didn't have to buy the shares, you got them. And that gave you the right to elect your board of directors and get any dividends that might be coming. So many of the native peoples are getting dividends, depends upon which corporation some need to better than others. But that's part of a change that we've had in Alaska. And I believe Norway looked at that model when they were deciding what to do with the North Sea oil. Now, before you leave, I want to draw your attention to this one last picture, because this is part of Alaska. And as you can see, it's flat. As visitors, you get to see our beautiful mountains. But we've got a lot of flat ground in Alaska. This happens to be in southwest Alaska, also up in the North Slope, it's flat. The other thing, please notice isolation. You only see one community in that vastness. And we have got hundreds of communities in Alaska that are not on the road system. And that includes places like this, also places like in southeast Alaska, which might be a small uh, fishing community that you've got to fly into or take a boat into. And of course, southeast Alaska is pretty much off the road system. You cannot drive to Juneau. And if you lived in a place like that, once a year a boat come, a barge comes up the river and on it will be all of the non-perishable groceries and building supplies and fuel and those kinds of things that you don't want to have to fly in because flying it costs so much. And so that's living out in the bush of Alaska and like I said, we've got hundreds of villages that are far, far, far away and you have to fly or take a boat to get to them. So with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. You've been a great group for me to be a docent for. And I wish you all a safe journey home. May all of your flights be uneventful and on time. And I am more than happy to answer questions or to talk about anything that you want to talk about, because there's a lot of stuff I didn't cover with all that stuff I did.